Gateway. Uh, I'm Pastor Peter, and today we are, like we already said, landing our series God of Old. I was, I was thinking about this actually while I was standing over in the corner there. I was like, when did we start this? It was back in September. I was counting it back. I was like, that's nine months ago. You could have started this series here without a child or the prospect of a child, <laughs> and you might have a baby today. It's been a little while. I don't know if I can deliver something as exciting as a baby at the end of all it, but I've loved this time here. I've loved the time in the Old Testament looking at who is the God that we meet from Genesis all the way through to Malachi. What story is he telling about how he's rescuing the world, how he loves his people, how he's not okay with sin and violence and death being a part of the just ebb and flow of every given year or day. I love this book. So today, as we look at this, I can feel my heart beating because it's like, wow, we're coming to the end. We're coming to the conclusion. We're coming to the wrap-up. It's exciting. We're going to be looking at the book of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament. If you want to find that and follow along, you can. We're going to be summarizing it today. But I also want to throw this picture up here on the screen you guys know what this is? Anybody know it? Just go ahead and shout it out. Mount Doom. Mount Doom. Lord of the Rings. All of those are correct answers. What's the name of the tower off to the side over there? This is, this is if you're a real nerd, you, you can answer this. Sauron's a good answer. The name of the tower is Barad-dur. I, I, I may have pronounced it wrong. but This specifically, though, is the very last screenshot of the film The Two Towers. So this is from The Lord of the Rings, a series of books written by J.R.R. Tolkien, and it was adapted to the screen back in the early 2000s by Peter Jackson. The second book, the second film, is called The Two Towers, and it ends with this, and then credits roll. And it's kind of ominous. It's kind of dark. It's kind of unsettling. The point is, we haven't hit resolution yet. There's been a big battle won for the forces of good. Yay! People are on their way to do the right thing. Yes! But then the screen pans up and you see, we haven't dealt with anything yet. The darkness is still there. The evil is still spreading. The real conflict has yet to be faced. And the two towers ends. As we wrap up our time in the God of Old series, finishing the Old Testament, I kind of feel like this is where we land. There's a lot that has not yet been dealt with. How is God going to actually live with these people? How are these people going to survive living with God? What's going to happen to the sin and the darkness in the story? Are people who are doing the wrong thing is going to be held accountable for that? And I sure hope that they aren't because that would be me. But then also I want them to be held accountable. It's not okay for sin to go unchecked. So all these things are sort of hanging out there. And I, and I love that Malachi is the last book in our Old Testament. He's speaking into a point of time where Israel has had a long journey with God now. They've been chosen by him. They've been rescued from slavery. They've been brought into a promised land. And then they've lost the promised land because they were faithless to God. And so they got a judgment instead. And they had to go off into slavery again, into oppression again, no homeland. But God preserved them and he brought them all the way back home to their homeland. And they're rebuilding the city and they're rebuilding the temple. And God is with them. And yet something feels uneasy. It feels like he's not with us in the way he thought he was going to be. The city isn't as great as we thought it was going to be. The temple is sort of a sad echo of what it used to be. Is this it? Is this the story? Well, it's only part one of two. And so Malachi brings us here, and at the end of this whole period of time, he presents us with a QA and a session with God, which I got to say is kind of cool, right? Like, that's a good way to end a big, long story like that Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. What just happened? What questions are you asking? 
here are some answers. And so I know that we might have our own questions, but Malachi gets to be the teacher here, and he gets to give us the questions that we're going to process through. And you know what? He's got some good ones. In this back-and-forth conversation that God has with the people of Israel at this moment in the story, these questions are raised, not just by Malachi, but by the hearts of the people. This is what we're asking. This is what we're processing after this long story. Does God actually love his people? Should God really get so angry the way that he has gotten angry and he's brought droughts and he's brought famine and he's brought sickness and he's brought exile and oppression? Should he really get this angry? Is following God worth it? Good questions. We're going to sort through these today because these are questions that I think many of us, even if we might not be asking them at this particular moment, we have a tendency to circle back to these. Does God love me? Is God really that upset about my sin and my stuff? Is it right for him to be that way? Is it worth it? There's a lot of suffering that we get as we follow Jesus. Is it worth it? So they're good questions. Will you pray with me as we come to God's word and we listen to what he says to us through Malachi? Jesus, thank you for calling us out as your people. And for all of us who are here in this room who have said yes to Jesus, our anthem is that you chose us and you've loved us and you've done everything to make us yours. And so we are here for you. And for those of us in the room who haven't said that yet and we're not sure yet and these questions are ringing through our hearts and we're not sure. Spirit, I invite you to do the work that only you can do. To speak in ways that I can't to answer questions and draw hearts to you in love. You are our hope. You are a good hope. We follow you. Amen. All right, let's take a look at this first question here. All right, does God actually love his people? Here's how it is brought up in the story or in the, in the, by Malachi. Malachi says, I have always loved you, says the Lord, but you retort, Really? How have you loved us? Now, you know this is going to be good because this, if you notice there in the bottom there, Malachi 1 2, that means this is the second verse in the story, right? He goes straight for the, the really nitty gritty, juicy stuff. He's like, all right, let's get down to it. We're in this relationship. Do you or don't you love me? That's what Israel says. And God's like, you're asking me this? This isn't date one. This isn't date two. This isn't like after dating for like a month and a half and so we're kind of getting down to like, is there something here in this relationship? This is at the 50th wedding anniversary, okay? And the spouse comes and says, do you even love me? I I don't know if you guys know that there's a play, The Fiddler on the Roof, and there's a song in there where the husband goes, do you love me? She says, do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes. For 25 years, I've cooked your meals and carried your children. And how can you ask me, do I love you? And that's what God says, actually. I mean, he doesn't say I carried your children and stuff like that or cooked your meals, but he says this. How can you ask me, do do you love me? Look at our story. I chose you. And he tells them this, this story that everybody knows from the very, very, very beginning. There were twins born, and God chose one, the forefather of Israel, the one who would one day take on the name Israel. And he didn't choose the other twin. And the other twin grew into a different nation called Edom. And he says, don't you see, there was nothing good or bad about that twin versus that twin. They hadn't done anything yet. They just popped out. But I chose them to make a point that I love you because I love you, because I chose you. I still choose you. How can you say, do you love me? And then he goes on, he says, you know, those two nations, they grew up and they started fighting. Israel, you're my people whom I chose. You got into conflict with Edom and Edom fought against you and I was there for it. And I was your defender, and I was your shield, and I fought for you. Why? Because I love you. Because you're my people. 
And it's not just Edom. It's all the other conflicts that you've gotten into as well. I rescued you from slavery in Egypt. I fought against the Babylonians, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Phoenicians, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Amorites. The... And it keeps going. Why? Because I'm warmongering? No. Because I love you and I'm here to protect you and to fight for you. How can you say, do you love me? Look at the story. And then the fun, the, he finishes off and says, I know that you're seeing this right now as you're here in your homeland and you're noticing that those Edomites, the descendants of that other twin, they're also in their homeland and they're kind of antagonistic right now. And you're kind of like, how come they're here? And you're saying, why are they around? And I thought you loved us, God, and we're your people, but they're the ones who have you know, the, the rights to the land or whatever. And God says, I have no covenant with them. I'm not here to restore them. I'm not promising I'm going to restore them. And they won't be there forever. And the implication of every single one of those statements is him saying, but I do have a covenant with you. I have promised this land to you. I have, I have promised to restore you. And I don't know if you've noticed, but you're asking these questions as you're still standing in the promised land, even though you were refugees less than a generation ago. And you should have been dispersed and forgotten. You weren't. I restored you, and I always will. Why? Because I love you. Does God actually love his people? The story of the Old Testament says yes, he does. So we come to the next question, which takes up actually the majority of the, uh, the book of Malachi. A series of questions, actually, that all come back to this idea. Should God really be this angry with us, his people? Like, is it right for God to get so worked up over our stuff and over our sin and over the things that we've done so that he can do the things he does? Now, here's a couple samples of the sort of things that they ask. Uh, they ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? How have we wearied him, wearied God with our words? When did we ever cheat you? Now, okay, nine months of following the story of Israel. If you've been with us that whole time, these questions are ridiculous. Right? When did we ever cheat on you? Are you kidding me? That's the story of how you guys kept going after this God and then this God and then this God. And God said, but you're my people and I love you and I protect you. And they're like, yes, I know, but just also... That's the story. And yet they have, at the end of this 50-year wedding anniversary, they're like, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the whole part. And he's like, I'm, where were you? How have we ever wearied him with our words? Um, when I hear this, I think of like, um, the conversations I have with my, my kids. Um, and they're like, why? And I'm like, I just told you why. They said, yeah, but Why? why did I just tell you why? Because you asked. Uh, yeah, but why? I don't know why you asked. It doesn't, you know, it's not really that, though. This is more of the idea of, if you will, jumping a little bit forward in parenting to the point where you're staying up late at night because your kids are doing things that you know they shouldn't. And when they come home, they say things that deeply wound your heart and you're grieved about it and you're kind of worried and wearied and then they come and say, well, when have we ever given you cause to worry? And you're just like, I, I'm sorry. Which example do you want? How have we ever shown contempt for your name? If you go back to the early moments where God is setting up this relationship and he says, here's the terms, here's the covenant that I want to make with you. Here's what I'm asking from you. Love God, love others. That kind of looks like these 10 different basic rules, you know. One of them is, when you carry my name with you, carry it with respect. Fill it with all of the glory of who I am. As you carry my name with you, make sure you treat my name with honor. And when you live out your lives, live it with honor because you carry my name with you. And he's saying, but you've treated my name with contempt. You've emptied it of the significance and of the truth of who I am You've lived ways that are different from my character. And then they're like, yeah, I'm not sure we ever did that. Except for like all the examples of when they allowed their systems to develop and oppress the poor. 
when they corrupted their justice systems, when they told the world that they needed alliances with foreign powers because God wasn't strong enough to protect them, and the list goes on. Essentially, it comes down to two things. They're saying, you know, God is overreacting, and we really aren't that offensive, God. And so Malachi responds, and I've got just two examples of the way that he kind of voices this proof that God actually isn't overreacting and that they really have actually been that offensive. And God responds in like two ways. So here's the first one. There's actually more than that. I'm just picking two. Is God overreacting? Well, he says this. Isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is. Now, I've got a cat, and our cat sometimes brings us gifts from the outside, these crippled, diseased, and mauled creatures. And I've never been pleased with it, actually. <laughs> Unless it was a mouse that he caught inside, and then I'm okay with it. This is like that. This is actually also really, I, I like this example because it's, it's like really easy to wrap my head around. Taxes. Everybody deals with taxes, right? And God's essentially saying, I've required a certain type of taxes from you. To run my temple, for me to have a staff in my temple where they are fed and cared for and that they minister and continue this relationship requires a certain taxing. And so he's done that. He's required these offerings. And he's supposed to come in and what they've brought have been the crippled and the diseased animals to take care of them. Would a governor be pleased with you offering that? If you go to the IRS and you said, you know, I buried some cash in my backyard, I didn't preserve it in any sort of a way, and I can't use it at the store any longer, but I figured I could use it to pay my taxes, would they accept it? No. Would you end up with fines and fees and in a lot of trouble if you said, you have no right? Yeah. God's not overreacting, partially because it's not just taxes. This is an example of many, but the point here is these are opportunities for Israel to worship him, to give him the first of everything that he's already given them, to say my work and my effort from Sunday through Saturday is empowered by you, and so you get the first of it because you are my God, my creator, and I worship you, and I honor you with this diseased animal. And it doesn't make sense. God's not overreacting. He's responding appropriately to the defame and the dishonor that they've given him. And so it kind of leads us to start seeing how maybe they would be offensive to God. And he gives this one example that, again, I just, I mean, there's other examples in Malachi, but this one is poignant. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you made with your wife when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Um, you pick the rom-com. There's a decent chance, I'll give it at least one out, like two out of three, that it's going to open with a scene where there's the protagonist and she's doing something that shows how faithful she is and how much effort she's putting into her relationship with her spouse or with her partner. And then she walks in on him cheating. And it blows the whole thing up. She moves on and starts a new relationship. And there's your, the beginning of the story. And nobody is sympathetic for the partner. And that's what God says. He says, you come to me and you say, you know, we're not that bad. And what he could say is, okay, but let's talk about all the abstract problems of you in relationship with me. Let's talk about the idolatry. Let's talk about the systemic injustices. Let's talk about the corruption. Let's talk about the tithing and all that stuff. And he can, and he does talk about that, and he calls it out. But here it pauses, and he sets that aside, and he comes right into the intimacy of the bedroom, and he says, in your life, on a day-to-day -day basis, you made promises and you didn't keep them. Even though the other person was faithful to you. But you tell me that that's not offensive? You tell me that I'm supposed to be pleased with you? 
And I know that that hasn't been all of our stories. And yet when I watch that, read that, hear that, all of a sudden what my heart does is like, wait a minute. Every decision I make, my life impacts the people around me. Because this impacted the people of Israel. This was their culture and it grew outward from there and it impacted the whole people. And God was saying, now you as a people do this. And I find that offensive. I called you to love me and love others. So you offer me diseased animals and you cheat on your wife. Am I right to be angry? Yeah, because these are just two examples out of how many I could have picked from. It's rough. But this is the answer to the question. Yeah, he should be angry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this here, but it's going to come up sort of again. There's this way of viewing the Old Testament where, where we tend to think of it as like a harsh space. Like this feels judgmental, maybe. Or this feels harsh. I, I kind of don't think that that's true. And I, I mean, I'm the guy who preached on violence and 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 preaching on conquest and and genocide and all that different stuff. Still, I think the story of the Old Testament is what happens when God doesn't hold people accountable, but instead just invites them back into his presence. What if the weight of sin doesn't actually ever get paid, and instead he, you know, just offer a couple goats? Does it change hearts? Does it fix it? Do people learn the lesson? No. No. What if God never gets angry? Then this goes on forever. Yes, God needs to get angry. Come to the third question. Is following God worth it? Again, the context for this is not the first month and a half of dating. The context for this is that 50th wedding anniversary coming up on that day and being like, I don't know. I look at all of the relationships that I have with my friends and the ones that they have with their spouses, and I'm like, has it been worth it for the last 50 years? That's a little rough. It stings. And so here, I just want to give it to you, let you see what happens. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord, but you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? Well, you have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed for those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them, they suffer no harm. Man, I'm sorry this is so heavy, guys. But these are the questions that we end up with at the end of the story of the Old Testament. People have gone through this relationship with God for years and generations and decades now, centuries even, and God has said, I'm a God of righteousness and a God of justice. I demand you live holy lives. And so sometimes they sort of try to do that and what they end up seeing happen is it doesn't seem to impact much. They still suffer. And the people who don't follow those things and who don't care, it doesn't seem like they end up in any worse of a place than they do. And so they finally all get sent off into an exile. They're all away from home. They're all like, man, we need to come back to God. So they come back to God and they're brought back home and they're like, this is it? Really? Where's the glory days? Where are the golden years to come? Where are all the promises coming true and the blessings and everything? And so they're like, you know what? At the end of the day, you say you're a God of justice, God, but all we see is empty promises and big inspirational speeches that don't turn into anything. And it hurts, it stings. And what's interesting to me is that after this whole Q&A of going back and forth in this conversation, at this God doesn't say anything. It's almost like we're kind of at the end of the book here. It's almost like he throws up his hands. He's like, I don't even know what to say. I've got nothing. What more can I say? What more can I do? What more could happen here? Have I been just? Where are you right now? In the promised land. Why? Because I made a promise. Did you deserve it? No, you didn't. But when you come back to me, I promise that I'd bring you back and you have been faithful to me to whatever extent that is and you're back. I told you if 
you disobeyed me, I would do all these things. I did all those things. He doesn't say anything. Instead, we get this little, um, sort of like an epilogue. Malachi kind of breaks in, gives us a little bit of narrative, and he says, at this point, those who feared the Lord, they gathered together, they wrote down their names in a book, and they said, God, we want to be your people. We're not going to ask these questions anymore. And it's not that asking questions is wrong. Using questions to spin God as the bad guy, to rationalize your behavior, to deny the goodness of God because you want somebody else to be in trouble instead of you, that sort of thing is not okay. Genuine wrestling is a little different. But these people come and they say, we want to be your people. We're not going to keep accusing you. You've been righteous, just. And God says, you will be my treasured possession. And then he sort of circles back to this idea and he says, guys, you want justice? You want me to show up with a judgment so the wicked are held accountable for everything they've done wrong. I'm going to do that. If I do that, this is what you're asking for. The Lord of Heaven's army says the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. You really want that? You want justice? After all of this relationship, after all of this, you can't see the mercy and the forgiveness that I've been offering you instead. You can't see the patience that I've been offering you instead. You want justice? And so Malachi, the central theme of Malachi, is the same, perhaps, as what we see as this, often see as the central theme of the Old Testament. Should God really be angry about this? And the answer is yes. As we go through the Q&A with God, what we end up seeing is that our sin does actually deserve God's judgment. And it's hard, and it's heavy, and it leaves us looking up, and the frame lifts, and what we see at the top is the same problem that we began with. Sure, there's been some victories along the way. Sure, there's been some resolution of story arcs, and yet hanging over the reality of where we're at at the, this point in the story, and as this book closes, the evil hasn't been dealt with, the dark, ominous thing is still there, and the path to resolution is straight into the volcano. And so I get it. I get why we tend to think about the... Um, the Old Testament through this lens of judgment and through this lens of it's dark and heavy and oppressive. But if I can stick with the two towers a little bit longer, do you guys know who these characters are? Sam and Frodo. Sam and Frodo. Sam's in the background there. Frodo's in the front. These guys are, this is, these guys are walking towards that volcanic mountain, Mount Doom, Doom Right? The reason they're doing that is because the guy in the foreground, Frodo, is carrying the ring that has the source of all the darkness and evil that's currently plaguing the world. He's got that, and he's taking it there to destroy it. It's the one and only way to actually destroy it. So he's sort of like the protagonist and the hero of the story. But here's a spoiler. He doesn't have what it takes. He's not enough. He fails. And so you wonder, how is the evil going to be overcome? How, how is this going to resolve? Is some super magic thing is going to happen at the end in the story to rescue everybody? Is there going to be some new magic superhero or superpower going to come in the return of the king, the last book that's going to change everything? Are the eagles going to show up and just take it there to the end? It's like a common complaint of the story. Anyway, no, none of that happens. You know what gets them through? You know what allows them to make it all the way there to the mountain? The guy in the background. The person who's been walking with him literally the entire way will eventually carry him when he doesn't have the strength to do the right thing. The story of the Old Testament is not just about answering this central question, should God really get so angry? That is hugely important. And the answer is yes. But all three of these questions are what the Old Testament is about. The God of old is the God who deeply loves his people. 
and who has stuck with them every step of the way. The God of old is the one who is not willing to let his people fail, was not let, willing to let humanity fall on its face, rebel against him, and be like, you know what, scrap that, start fresh with somebody new. No, he came and he chose humanity to bear his image. He chose us to be his people, to be his children, to be his family, and he said, I'm going to do what I need to do to restore and love you and to welcome you home again. That is the story of the God of old. That is the God who has walked Israel through the whole story. Yes, it is about why God gets angry and how none of us can bring an accusation to God saying, no, you don't have a right. You're overreacting. I'm the one exception. My friends are the one exception. We don't get to do that. You read the story and you realize that you are like Israel. I am like Israel. In some ways, you can probably make arguments or worse. But then we keep going. And Malachi doesn't end there. Malachi ends with the question, is following God worth it? And the answer to that is yes. From the beginning, God created this whole world. He made it good. He made it very good. He saw it as beautiful and whole, and he put us in it. He said, I want you to enjoy my beautiful garden, my beautiful creation. I want you to flourish. I want you to thrive. I want you to carry my image, and I'm going to give you this place of honor that I've given no other creature to rule over it. And I'm calling you to this as your father. I'm calling you to this, and I want to teach you how to do this well. I want to give you wisdom. I want you to know what is right and wrong, and I'm gonna teach you that myself. I want you to love me as the one who gives life, and I want to be right there to show you how to love each other. Malachi is the only place in the entire Old Testament where the wife is called a partner. I don't know if that throws you off. That throws me off. Because the culture doesn't say that. The culture does not use this word to describe the wife. Men can be partners. Men can be equals. Not men and women. And yet it is the way of God, the heart of God, the Spirit speaking wisdom and saying, this is the pattern for my world and for my living. This is what is good and whole and is right that comes to Malachi and says, no, partner. You will treat her like an equal with respect and dignity, caring for her that she would flourish, not abandoning her when you're bored. Is it worth that? Is it worth it? Is God's way good? Yes, it is good. And that is the story of the Old Testament. Malachi leaves us with this picture. He says, for you who will fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. You will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. That's a picture that's full of life, isn't it? Now, I, I've never raised cattle. Um, everything that I know about raising cattle comes through like dramas, like documentaries and stuff like that. Even so, my limited understanding of this is enough to be able to say, this, this is a pretty joyous, positive, wholesome image. For a baby cow, a calf, to be freed from its pen or whatever, to go out bounding around in the fields and enjoying life, and for God to turn and say, I'm going to do everything to make sure that you get that. You want to bound around in some nice fields? That's God's vision for his people. And all of the shame and all the stuff that we carry and all the whatever, he says, I'm going to come to heal, not to condemn, not to break. I'm going to come to heal. And it's for those who fear my name. Because it is right for him to get angry when people don't care. 
when people set him aside and when people set other people aside. And this is the story of the God of old. It leads us 100% every time to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who can do the thing that's impossible in the Old Testament, that can bring us to the resolution. So all you need to do is take Malachi, flip one page over, and read the story of Jesus. How he comes to bring healing, how he comes to change hearts, to walk us through death and lead us to an eternal life with God forever. Because we trust the God of old, we're ready to follow Jesus. And that's the whole point of this series. To go back and see who he is and then see why Jesus came and to follow him. Gateway, love you guys. I'm gonna pray, invite the worship team out here. Father, thanks so much for being who you are, for being the faithful, steady God who hates sin, won't let it go unanswered, but is patient and merciful and deals with it through Jesus instead of making us face that on our own. We love you and we want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.